hope you all enjoyed your lunch. Okay, so I am Wujud Alawaki from the Research and Evaluation Center here at John Jay College, and I would like to introduce panel three. Panel three will be discussing the findings of the effectiveness of the cure violence approach here in New York City. So please help me welcome to the stage, Jeffrey Butts from the Research and Evaluation Center at John Jay College. Sheila Delgado, also from the Research and Evaluation Center. Travis Fronius from West Ed. Charlie Ransford from the National Cure of Violence. And Katerina Roman from Temple University. So this is about the state of the evidence, and I'll just start off to my left here with Katerina, who's doing research on this model in Philadelphia. So how would you describe the state of the evidence? If, if like a practitioner approaches you or someone, a police official, and says, does this cure violence actually help? What do you say? Now, here we are 15, almost 20 years in, and we have about a dozen evaluations. And the evaluation evidence is basically saying the more rigorous eye that we put on the evaluation, the stronger job we do as evaluators, and we make sure that we're evaluating programs that have been well implemented and are in the right places, things look good and we see significant results. So having evaluated dozens of anti-violence programs around the country, I truly believe that if you sift through all the different types of evidence, some programs might have been evaluated, look like they border on significant results, but then the evaluators say, hey, there were some problems with implementation. If we get past all that, the strong programs show evidence of success. So, Charlie, uh, Director of Policy at Cure Violence, you must have this conversation all the time where people are asking you, can you really show that it works? Um, you're in a difficult position because you're representing the organization when this question comes to you and you have to, um, I'm assuming, um, put on a positive, uh, you have to give a positive message, act confident, but I assume you're also aware how difficult it is to evaluate this model. How do you describe the state of the evidence? Uh, I would say the evidence is both strong and, and, and consistent too. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's a tendency for some people to look at when people try to do things similar to what we do and, and it, sometimes it works, doesn't work. There's the tendency for people to, to kind of put that on the model itself. But I think if you look at when the model is implemented in the way it's supposed to be implemented, with the training from the actual Cure of Ireland staff, like Marcus and Kobe, like one of the things you have to realize is they've been training people for years. They've seen what makes a program <coughs> fail. They've seen what, what, what makes a program work and what kind of help they need, what kind of training they need. That kind of experience goes a long way. And it, it can't just be picked up by people that have read the papers. And so when you, when you have that kind of experience, when you have the right workers in place, uh, the evidence is incredibly consistent. Um, and you know, when I'm talking to policymakers, you know, I, I definitely make that point. Um, but I think what I try to emphasize in addition to that, and something that I think is not talked about a lot, is all the other stuff that's in the evidence that people don't necessarily pull out. People pull out the headlines of this, you know, 50% reduction in killings or, you know, 70% reduction in shootings. But what they don't necessarily pull out that is also in a lot of these evaluations is that we're helping people get jobs. We're helping people become better parents. We're helping the children of the people that we work with. Uh, you know, we're helping people get educations. We're helping people get prepared to go into the workforce. Uh, you know, all this work that that people aren't necessarily recognizing goes into what we do. And another big aspect of it too is, you know, there's a lot of talk nowadays about reentry work and how we need to do more for reentry. Uh, you know, in the state of Illinois, a couple years back, we are the largest employer of people that were formerly incarcerated in the entire state. Um, and so, I mean, that's you know, that's another element of the work. And so, when I when I talk to policymakers, I try to explain the the breadth of the evidence and the strength of it and how consistent it is. Trevor, your organization, WestEd, just reviewed the state of evidence on violence reduction. Um, when you were reviewing all of these the studies that applied to this model, cure violence, formerly known as ceasefire, um, what what was your assessment? Um, we hear. Um, sometimes people, um, because we're all human beings, we pick and choose the evidence that feels comfortable to us. Did you see um, negative evidence? Um, did, was there any alignment between the quality of the study and the message at the end? How would you summarize the, the evidence? Cure violence in the 
empirical literature in the evidence base is prominent, it's strong. Uh, it's up there with uh, a number of other initiatives in terms of the depth and breadth of research related to the program. Within the care violence evaluation literature, um, depending on the study that you look at, it's been implemented with varying degrees of uh, fidelity to the model, depending on you know various components of that, whether it's quality of training, um, representation from the national staff, et cetera. When you take all that into account, there is a consistent message for care violence. I think it's important when we're talking about the evaluation literature to really understand the nuance of the evaluation behind it, not just the methodology, which tends to be pretty consistent, not only within cure violence, but across some of the more rigorous studies. It's important to know, and whether or not we get into it today, it's, you know, it's really difficult to evaluate these initiatives rigorously. And rigor could mean many different things. A lot of folks uh, just tie randomized control trial to a rigorous impact evaluation or study. For these initiatives, we're focusing on the quality of quasi-experimental design studies, so really understanding the validity of those studies. And by and large, a number of the care violence evaluations are with quality and show positive results. Right. <clears throat> Ms. Delgado. Yes. Um, so you, you manage this process, this whole study, um, and when we start out new research, our goal is to always make it perfect. How far from perfect did we end up? <laughs> Just say perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to defer to what Katarina said. Um, so it is so challenging to evaluate. I mean, what Trevor just said is so on point, right? And all of the, everyone in here who's been part of the research team, the NYC Cure research team, like stand up because there it's, people probably want to ask you questions. Um, what we did to contribute to the um, literature in Cure Violence, or it's to build on what Daniel Webster and his team did in Baltimore, which is, was, was to measure norm change. So we went out and surveyed over 5,000 young men in New York City in neighborhoods with and without cure violence programs. And man, it was a challenge. We, um, we had to do this every single day, Monday through Sunday, nonstop. Um, and every single, after every single um, survey site, we had to come together and identify all of the things that we did wrong so that we could get better the next time. And I think every single time, um, that we had to visit a neighborhood, we did better. We saw evidence that we couldn't, we'll come back from the neighborhoods and see the Man Up team, right? And just see how young men um, think of, or what they think of the men of the workers. And you come back trying to be objective, but at the same time you like fall in love with the model yourself because you see it firsthand when you're talking to young men in the neighborhood about their experiences with violence and what this, you show them a picture of Brother Tim, right? And they're like, oh, that's my guy. It's like things that you can't capture with numbers, but um, it's so important. And we'll come back and just be like really grateful that we have this opportunity. So I would say that we tried really, really hard to do the best job we could. And um, with all the challenges and everything, I think we did a pretty good job. <laughs> So I, I noticed um, you talked almost exclusively about norm change, norm change, and our efforts to at, do surveys in the community to pick up on attitudinal change, um, and that, to be honest, was probably um, three quarters of our labor just doing all those surveys. So it was the most costly component of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And my question to anyone or maybe everybody: um, Does that really matter? Um, we know that part of the key component of the model is, people said it before, like change, the change starts in here, and so we want to know how people are thinking about violence. That's how behavior changes, that's how communities ultimately change. But in the struggle for resources, um, if you can't present solid research findings to people with the deep pockets and who pass the laws and hand out money, um, if we can show them that attitudes change, is that sufficient? Um, and then the reverse of that is if all we show is changes in crime and we don't know how those changes happened, 
It's just a mystery. It's what we always call the black box. Like something changed, but we don't know why. How do, what's the proper balance? How important is it to measure attitudes and norms as part of studying this model? The beauty of cure violence is that the workers are out there, you're out there changing in that instant what is happening. You're changing the behavior that then also can lead to the attitude, and you're simultaneously working to change attitudes with the messaging. Do you see how important that is, that simultaneous track? But it's so difficult. I think with the research, we're not there yet. We don't know what leads to what. We can't say that with our numbers, even when the evaluations are successful and we see, you hear our language all the time, significant reductions in community level violence. But what was that mechanism for change? So all I can say is we still don't know a lot and we need more work on looking at mediations, type of mediations related to some of those attitudes and then behaviors. First of all, we have to realize that violence is a behavior. You know, it's, it's not anything other than just a behavior. It's a way that people are behaving. And one of the biggest drivers of behavior is what your people around you expect you to do, or at least what you think that they expect you to do. That is really, the social pressure is huge in driving people's behavior, whether it's violence, whether it's smoking, whether it's wearing a suit today, or whether it's wearing something else. Social pressure really matters. And so figuring out how we, we shift that social pressure so that it's encouraging people to not be violent is, is really key. And you know, when it comes to norm change, um, you know, this is an aspect of the model, just like all aspects of the model, that we are constantly working on and constantly trying to figure out how we can do a better job. And, and when it comes to norm change, it really is about repetition, and it's about multiple messengers saying the same thing. And, and to what Katerina said, a lot of it, too, is about behavior first that then starts to shift what that expectation of the people around you is. And so, you know, in our minds, and I would love to, for more research to be done around this, in our minds, some of the biggest norm change activities we do are the conflict mediations. Because, you know, you have that person being helped to make a different choice in behavior, and then all of a sudden that changes not only how they think of what they're doing, what they're doing, to people around them, but it, it changes what everybody else around them, all their friends see, and what they now understand to be the expectation. Now there's the expectation that you can do things, you can settle things peacefully. And so, you know, I, I think it, it's incredibly important to shift attitudes, and a lot, of, like you said, there's a lot more research that needs to be done, but this is, I, I think, one of the key pathways to stopping violence. And I would just add to that, too. Um, so we heard from Department of Health earlier, that we need to look deeper, better understand the structural violence and structural justice that's going on in these communities, and really understand the neighborhood dynamics that lead to violence and normal attitudes related to violence. For us to understand that, we need to look beyond some of the behavior change, focus on norms. So to your question, is it enough just to look at uh, behavioral change? No, I think we do need to look at attitudes. We need to look at norms. To me, there's no doubt that people are doing the work. It is just so difficult to, you know, try to save a life and do all these mediations and then go back and enter information into some database. Um, I had an honest conversation with someone from Cure Violence recently, and the, the reality is that things have, have not gotten better in terms of entering information about the data, how many mediations are happening, um, you know, uh, what these mediations consist of. And I know everybody wants to know what's in this black box. How do we, how do we uncover, like, what is that mechanism that changes things? Because we do see the greater change, but what is it that is driving that? And I think we can just put it on our side and become just more creative in ways that we measure those things. So we can get more creative on this side and, and get better because I think we need to come to the reality that, you know, entering data into a spreadsheet for people who are actually doing the work, it's really difficult and probably the last thing they think about. Yeah, that related to my next point, I think research is the last thing a lot of people think about. And what are the costs of that and do we, do we really need this? What would happen if we just stopped doing research? What would happen to this model, this movement, 
if we stopped doing this with our cute little bar charts and our numbers, would things get worse? Is this really necessary? Um, and how long do you think the movement would persist without the backup of evidence and numbers? I could begin to address that. I mean, I feel like, um, yeah, I mean, research sounds to, I think, a lot of people like it shouldn't be prioritized maybe as much as it is. But, um, I mean, I think our perspective is th this is about an approach. It's about a way of addressing the issue of violence. And it's about empowering communities in ways that allow them to decrease the violence. And, uh, you know, there's another approach out there. There's another perspective of, you know, that uh, it's, it's about punishment and it's about suppression and it's about people from outside the community coming in to reduce the violence. And so, you know, we have our perspective about doing things and it's, you know, and, we, and, we, and we've been very successful at it. You know, we, we, I think we've gotten large reductions, but the reduction of 50% is not the goal. The goal is to get rid of the violence, the 100% reduction. And so where the research really comes in and where it's really crucially important is helping us figure out if we have the right perspective, the right approach, how can we make it work? You know, we, 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 this community that's only gone down 50%, how can we get it down to 100%? What's working about it? What's not working about it? How can we make this model better? And you know, I, I'm tired of having these debates about this, uh, this program or that program, who has the biggest reduction. To me, it's, it's about the approach, the approach of caring for people, helping people thrive, coming from the inside of the community as opposed to the outside of the community. It's the approach. Now let's do the research to figure out how to make it more effective, how to make it work to 100% level. I assume you've all heard the phrase evidence-based practice, evidence-based programs. Uh, I see that as a real threat to this model because, as I said before, the, the way to get strong evidence is to have a lot of data points. And the way to have a lot of data points with strict control over what they get is to do evaluations about individual people. Um, think about when you see a lonely bird flying through the sky, you can sort of see where they're going. When you see a flock of birds, you can see the shape, you can see the direction, you can see when they turn. You learn a lot more with multiple data points. And when you have a thousand people to go through a program, even 150 people to go through a program, you follow up with individuals to see if the mediation worked for them. You get a lot more data from that. You can do controlled studies. You can assign people randomly either to get the mediation or not the mediation. And that is literally how evidence is built. And you hear people, I was going to say in Washington, maybe not so much anymore, people in Washington who worship the quality of evidence and only want to do a program if it's scored big on the board, on the big board of evidence with multiple random assignment studies. We have to do studies that look at this neighborhood versus that neighborhood. They did cure violence. They got CMS support. That neighborhood didn't. And all you have, that means you have two cases. You're comparing two places and there's just two birds flying through the sky. You can't see the shape. Um, so can this model survive in a world where we worship random assignment studies and powerful effect size? Or is there, a, is there a way to move forward without violating the principles of the model to do individual level follow up? And I don't know if, if anyone's thought of that or people are working on it. Most cure violence research is about group level differences, neighborhood level differences. Are there people or should we be thinking about collecting individual level data? Well, we, we're absolutely thinking about that cure violence. I mean, we want to figure out how we can get the best evidence to support the model. I mean, we clearly want to know that what we're implementing is moving things in the right direction. So we need evidence. But the problem with this concept of evidence based is it tends to look at one measure. Like, are you reducing, when it comes to violence prevention, are you reducing violence? But what it misses are all the side effects that some programs have. You know, if a program is arresting 70 people and throwing the community and the families into chaos, if it's, if it's responding to the bad act of one person by arresting all of their friends, these are side effects that really matter and really have an effect on people, but they're not being considered. They're not even being put into our consideration about, we're just labeling something as evidence-based because it's moving one marker. Another, another question that comes up often is, I think the word component has been used already. Um, do we even know what the key components are? The way I always ask this question is, if you think about all the things that a Cure Violence program does, 
If you had to, which one of those things would you stop doing? If you had to stop one thing? Mediations, public messaging, I mean, pick one. Do we even know enough about it yet to know which, which ingredient could not, would ruin the, ruin the soup if we took it out? Um, well, I mean, we've had to make that decision in some places. Uh, you know, there's been programs, for instance, in Baltimore where, where, you know, there just wasn't enough funding to have the full program. So what do you do? And I think what we've tried to do is uh, we've tried to implement mediation because we see it, the importance of stopping that event in changing both the attitudes, the norms, the behaviors. Like, if you have exposure to violence, if that event is allowed to happen, then there's just there's so much harm that follows that. And there's so much potential for retaliation that follows that. So, I mean, if you ask me what the most important element of the model, I think it's, it's the, the mediation. Now, I, that doesn't mean I think you can get rid of the other elements, because you need to do follow-up, and you need to you know, provide care for the individual and address whatever issues that they need to address for themselves. Um, so, you know, I, I, it's a shame that we have to be, be making these decisions, that we can't have full programs that, that do everything, but... Um, but do we know if the full program is related to efficacy? Do we, or do we just think about it as a whole, or can has it, no one's done this? I assume no one's ever studied cure violence with the detail to know which things contributed most to the outcomes. Am I wrong about that? You're right about that, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, we need to understand that better, absolutely. And um, you know, I think you, you mentioned RCTs before. I think. Although we can't do an RCT on the whole model, I think we can do RCTs about, well, what happens if you add in this element to this one community, but all these other sites don't add that one element in? You know, what happens when you put uh, you know, staff support services into one community? Does that really make the, I think those are the ways that we can start to, to do sort of you know, RCTs at a community level that can start to tell us something about the components of the model, but it hasn't been done yet. And I, if we're gonna invest in research, uh, the type of research that I like to see, I feel like you know, we've had I think five or six evaluations, independent evaluations. I think we have about four or five more that will be coming out in the next uh, year or two, some in the next couple months. And um, you know, I think what we really need now for research is figuring out what works, what makes it work, what are the components that need to be added in. And I think we need to start experimenting with adding more components as opposed to what can we take away. Thank you. One of the things that we did for the evaluation was we set out to interview every single Cure Violence staff member. So probably a lot of you know Wagu, know Patricia, know Nicole, um, Quan and Jay, a lot of people here helped develop the survey. And one thing that Quan really contributed to it was like, well, what is that thing? Can we ask them about this transformation that was said in an earlier panel? It was said a lot. Um, and we asked a couple of questions like, were you, prior to joining your team, did you do any community activism? Or, um, you know, the most common things are like, were you formerly incarcerated? Do you, did you grow up in your program neighborhood? Um, and again, I know it's not about comparing programs, Charlie, but you do see stronger evidence where you do see people that have had prior experience. Most importantly, I think it's the anonymous relationships that they have with their participants. So no one, I mean, obviously everybody's probably skeptical in the beginning, but the anonymity component, not having that trust that no matter what, you're not gonna turn me in, is I think it has to be in the soup. Otherwise, the soup is not gonna taste good. <laughs>